Can you tell us how you first started writing music? Many, you know, many people think that I am a musician by occupation, and I'm not a musician by occupation. So I've, I've never been a professional musician, um, but um, I've always loved music, and um, when I pick up a guitar, I want to write a song. So what I basically am is someone who has a very strong inclination to write songs. And, um, it, you know, it happened spontaneously when I was about nine or ten. Uh, and someone, I was with some kids, and someone was talking about a, a song they heard on the radio. And just for a skylark, I said, oh yeah, I heard a new song too. And I spontaneously sang a song that I created on the spot. And, um, and they thought it was credible. They, you know, they bought it. And sort of from that time on, actually, I had been writing songs. So mostly what I am is a person who writes songs. So I've never been a professional musician, but I love writing songs. So can you tell us how you became a Baha'i? I became a Baha'i in 1972. I came from a non-religious home. My father was anti-religious. And um, a, a friend of mine became a Baha'i. And in 19, around about 1972, a lot of the young Baha'is were really on fire with the spirit. They, they were talking about Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and all of the stories associated with them. They were really on fire. And no one could help but be affected by their spirit. And I was affected by that spirit. And, you know, they needed... I loved the Baha'i teachings, but I had, at the age of 22, I had no knowledge or experience of God and religion. Um, but I was very influenced by their spirit. And they needed a Baha'i in the area I was living. There was no Baha'i. And kind of like, as an act of friendship, I said, look, if it's important, put my name down. And that's how I initiated becoming a Baha'i. But I was like a Baha'i on paper, because I did it out of kindness, you know, like to help, to help my friend. And, um, and then I walked away and did my life, and I had no real contact with it for a couple of years. And then I came back to the same area, and my friend came to me and said, look, um, you'll make the ninth person to create a local assembly here. Will you come to this meeting where we can elect a local assembly? Sure, you know, I'll come. So I went to this meeting, and we had this election, <clears throat> and I was elected chairman of the assembly. And I knew nothing at all about I was a Baha'i on paper, and I knew nothing whatsoever about Baha'i administration or anything. And I thought, wow, I'm going to either have to walk away from this, or I'm going to have to find out what it is and be, be, you know, be responsible. And that was the aha moment, because I then looked at it and thought, OK, I'm going to try and I'm going to commit to this. And um, so it was being elected that made me commit. How has the Baha'i faith influenced your music? When I became a Baha'i in 1972, there were very few Baha'i songs. In fact, in most Baha'i gatherings I came to, people were singing, God is one. God is one. Man is one. And um, oh, it's just great. But I wondered if we might have another one or two songs. And um, so I began writing some songs with Baha'i themes. And because the, the Baha'i faith is really um, probably the most important influence in my life, that's, that's where I went with my music. Can you tell us a little bit about the intersection of storytelling and your music? I've got a, a strong 
instinct for story. So I love story. I've always loved story. And those early believers and those heroic acts are incredible stories. And so that is what drew me to that. And then, so I began writing songs about those subjects. And people would say to me, oh, you're the guy who writes about the martyrs. And I had no idea that I was the guy who wrote about the martyrs. I, you know, I wasn't consciously doing that. Um, I was just doing it, <laughs> you know. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> Cool, yeah, it, well, it, wasn't, it wasn't a planned thing or a designed thing. Yeah. It was just, I'd, I'd read about something and I'd then I thought, oh, I'm going to do a song about that. So what advice would you give to others who wish to explore their creative potential? Everything is possible. Anything and everything is possible. And if you have, um, if anyone has an inclination to write a story, or a poem, or a song, or a painting, or um, you, you need to start. You know, Abdul Baha, someone asked um, Abdul Baha, is there anything, such thing as good luck in the world? And he said, the confirmations and blessings from God are always present and they are open to every human being, every human being, wherever they are, can access those confirmations and blessings. However, he said there is one condition that is needed. They need to act. It's not going to happen by praying. It's not going to happen by thinking. They need to act. And he gave the example that if you want fruit, you have to plant a fruit tree. And if you plant the fruit tree and tend to it, it will give you fruit for the rest of your life. But you have to act. And so I would say to anyone who has an interest in expressing themselves creatively, to take up the pen, to take up the paintbrush, to, to, to just begin, be, do, act. You need to act. Can you share some of your thoughts on the power of prayer? So we were talking about the confirmations and blessings that are available to every human being wherever they are. And every Baha'i and many people will, will pray. And it occurs to me that um, in my experience there's a prayer needs serious intent so that you know, if we were dancing, there are times in our lives when someone will ask us to dance and we don't really feel like it, but we do it and we go through the motion. And there are other times when you're really in the zone and you want to dance and you let go and you dance. It's that second mode, I think, that we need to get into if we're, serious, if we're seriously praying about something, and then confirmations come when we're serious about it. You know, there was a time that Abdul Baha was asked to help heal a girl. He prayed all night. He prayed 12 hours. When do we, any of us pay for pray 12 hours for anything? But it showed how serious the, you know, the girl was dying and he saved her. I think that I would say to each one of us, if we really have a, a challenge in our lives, to sit down and seriously pray, and, and then to act as well. And I think, think good things will happen. So why do you think it's important to include creativity in our lives? Patterns of thought and patterns of actions need to be challenged. You know, we need to, it's like the Buddhist principle of mindfulness. We need to think consciously and, and think with a, a new eye at something 
And um, we need to apply independent investigation of truth to our own thinking and our own actions and our own patterns of actions. And um, yeah, but I think that we do need to bring creativity into our living in that sense. Can you share something about the Baha'i faith that you've been reflecting on recently? Yeah, I have a lot, actually, Mason. I have a lot of things that I chew on. And um, one of the big ones is that I think that we need to be courageous about um, sharing the Baha'i faith with others. And um, I'm right into, um, you know, teaching the Baha'i faith. I'll use the word teaching the Baha'i faith to others because I think that this is... This religion is a unique, what other organization in the world is in every country in the world, which is absolutely united, which has common values and principles, which are for the good of all people wherever they are. This, this, this is, what else, you know, this is going to really help communities of human beings everywhere. This is fantastic stuff. So I want people to share this and, and say, look, join us, Re join us. This is, we need you, and together we'll, we can transform this whole planet. So that's one big thing for me. The second thing is that um, I, I want the Baha'i community to be colorful. I want it to be colorful and imaginative. We are here, uh, we're sitting here in Brisbane. We're at an Ink of Light, a writers, Baha'i Writers Festival. Fantastic. People getting together, sharing really um, significant, creative, and imaginative ideas in imaginative ways. It's colorful, illuminating, beautiful stuff. I want this. I want this everywhere. I'd like to see people bring color into the community. So what comes to mind when you think about the dispensation of the Bab? When I think of the Bab, I think of the door or gate in a, in a very, really large way. I think of it as, you know, sometimes you see photographs of Persian towns where they have a huge, elaborate threshold or portal. And I sort of see the, when I think of the barb, I think of that on a universal scale. Uh, you know, like something, architecture of light on a global scale and, uh, and a procession of P Persian magic, you know, Persian carpets and opening the way to the king to come in. That, that's what I'm, I think of. So what can we learn then from the dispensation of the Bab? Well, I, I mean, I, I think one of the, the, the themes is um, courage because you know, there was a time, <clears throat> 1844, this one Baha'i, uh, one, sorry, one believer of the Bab. And um, the, the Bab is saying to 17, 18 others, all right, now go forth and let people know. And that, that principle of having the courage and the enterprise and the commitment, stamina, and discipline to go out and look at this, I, I think, I really, I want to see that happen here now.